to our, our audience. Uh, the justices of the United States Supreme Court operate at such a high profile level that most lawyers can at least identify on a map their judicial philosophies. However, um, we think that Ohio Supreme Court justices on this issue often fly too far under the radar. So to help us get a better feel for your judicial philosophies, if you kind of, uh, I think what would be helpful is if you pick a member of the United States Supreme Court who best typifies your particular judicial philosophy. Maybe there isn't one, or maybe there are several, but if you could pick just one, that would be great, and explain why uh, that particular member of the United States Supreme Court best reflects your philosophy. Justice O'Donnell. Well, thank you. This is an interesting question, and it's one that I've spent some time looking at, because while it may be clear to you, Maurice, or some of you in the audience, it isn't clear to me exactly what the philosophy is of the nine members of the United States Supreme Court. I guess I thought I knew what Justice Roberts' views were, but recently I've, I've caught him reconsider uh, exactly where his views are, especially on the Commerce Clause as it relates to the United States Constitution. But it's a great question because it gave me a moment to reflect. I appreciate the fact that Justice An uh, Anthony Kennedy is the swing vote on the court and is widely viewed as such. But his views, as I'm given to understand, fall from a moral perspective, and he is more of a moralist on the court. And then I found it so interesting that Elena Kagan, uh, while predicted to be uh, a ruling in a certain fashion has not yet come uh, to to that view. I guess the bells are ringing. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but um, church bells. <laughs> and I and I studied uh, Stephen Breyer, who is a pragmatist on the court, and then of course um, I, I began to read about what's been written on. Antonin Scalia's philosophy as a textualist or as an originalist in terms of constitutional uh, application and, and come to find out that, that scholars would say that Clarence Thomas is far more conservative than is Antonin Scalia. And without going into the rest of it, I, I began to, to look at decisions that I have written and participated in to try to develop exactly where I was. And I guess I can tell you that in certain instances I think Scalia is correct, in others I think Kennedy might be correct, and in still others I think uh, Justice Roberts uh, also exhibits uh, 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 the kind of case decision making that, that is in accord with my thinking. So I, I'm unable to uh, tell you that one or another of the members of the court are exactly the, the profile that you might find in, in my case decision making. It's best described by my view to approach each, each case with an open mind, consider what the facts and the law are, and, and reason to a conclusion. And Justice Cuff, you've got a helping hand from Justice O'Donnell, who laid out many judicial philosophies and many of the justices. So, uh, well, um, I, won't, I won't repeat those. We'll I'll just that. concur in, in, in those remarks. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's a little bit um, uh, inaccurate uh, to be able to uh, adopt a justice and say that's the one that we mostly agree with because it's true. There's always some things that we might uh, think that we would um, decide differently. Of course, we don't have the record. We don't have the oral arguments in those uh, cases. But I think it's uh, also a little bit uh, dangerous to pick a mem current member of the uh, court because they come with the sort of the current issues uh, and it's sort of emotionally laden and depending on what side you are. So I'd like to just step back a little bit and uh, say that uh, probably um, a former justice that I agree a great deal with was uh, uh, now the late uh, Chief Justice uh, William Rehnquist, who actually, by the way, came to Ohio and helped uh, to dedicate the Ohio Judicial uh, System <coughs> when, when it uh, first opened. And the reason that I mention um, William Rehnquist is that he was really a model of judicial restraint. Uh, as a Chief Justice, he had power to essentially reinterpret uh, the Constitution and the laws, but um, he didn't believe that he had the authority uh, to do that, and instead deferred often to the legislative branch of government and to uh, precedent uh, that uh, was uh, decided, uh, rather than trying to write his own preferences uh, into the law. 
He also sought to uh, enforce the constitutional restraints on uh, Congress's commerce power. And we know that very often Congress tries to get into the local communities and regulate what local communities and states do, and he helped to preserve uh, state uh, prerogatives. And maybe even uh, just as important is that even the, um, uh, all the philosophical, uh, uh, regardless of the philosophical view of the other members of the court, they held him in high regard because he had real warm and cordial relations with all of the members of the court. Uh, and I think that's really an important aspect of being a jurist as well. Thank you. And uh, just Judge O'Neill, uh, same question to you. I'm glad it happened early in the, in the event. Uh, Justice uh, Cup and I are in agreement. Uh, the, the day that Justice Rehnquist came to open the, the Ohio Supreme Court, I was there in my robes, and uh, I don't think I've ever been more proud to be a jurist in Ohio to have the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court opening our new home. Uh, following Justice O'Donnell's uh, uh, analysis, uh, I guess off the court right now, I've always been a big fan of Sandra Day O'Connor, and, and, and the reason being that she was so unpredictable. You could, not, you could not figure out which way she was going to go, and she was always uh, the swing vote. And I think that's the mark of a good jurist, that you're unpredictable and you don't know what to do. I will come out uh, strongly on one justice, and that would be Justice Scalia. We don't agree. He seems to be a very well-educated, bright person. But I have a problem with any justice that I believe to be outcome-oriented. I'm reminded when I was first a judge on the Court of Appeals and I was doing a, I thought, a, a workmanlike project on a search case for a school locker and I wrote, you know, I'm a, I'm a former journalist and I, I, I wrote that it is, it is improper to talk about the grandeur of the United States Constitution in the morning and violate its basic tenets in the afternoon when they say that, you know, kids have no constitutional rights to privacy. And my law clerks were all with me until they came across a Scalia opinion, which was the student athlete search case. You might remember the, the United States Supreme Court said, well, if you're a student athlete, we'll search you whenever we want to without probable cause at random. And I thought that was wrong. And when you gave me this question, I, I, I like it. I'm a scholar. I like doing research. And last night I went back and I wanted to see what Scalia said, and I want to share it with the world because I was so enraged 12 years ago. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again. Is it time? Yeah, it's time. So you go quickly. I'll do it quickly. Legitimate privacy expectations are even less with regard to student athletes. School sports are not for the bashful. They require suiting up before each practice or event, and showering and changing afterwards. That was how Justice Scalia justified an unreasonable search. I don't like him. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Senator Skindel, please, same question. Thank you. Uh, the question uh, did not require us to uh, pull upon uh, uh, current uh, Supreme Court justices. So I'll go into history a little bit. And one of the justices uh, that I uh, would like to emulate is uh, a former uh, United States uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, who was also the former governor of the state of Ohio, Salmon Chase. Uh, <coughs> governor Chase, uh, Justice Chase, uh, what he is uh, not really, uh, um, the average person does not know about him, but he was the individual that played a key role in the preservation of our union uh, with, re, uh, uh, with, with respect to funding uh, uh, the, uh, our efforts in the North uh, the uh, our troops and working as the Secretary of Treasury under Abraham Lincoln and being a member of the team of rivals. But on the United States Supreme Court, uh, what uh, Sam and Chase did was gave excellent legal analysis that formed uh, how we interpret and apply the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. In addition, what was best known of Sam and Chase was his fairness on the court. He was the justice presiding over the impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson. And despite the uh, political pressures on all sides, uh, Salmon Chase was known of having an even and fair hand 
uh, during that uh, impeachment trial. And that's what I want to be known for as a Supreme Court uh, uh, justice here in Ohio. One other person that I would call upon a little bit more recent uh, would be Justice Stephen Breyer. And what I liked about Justice Stephen Breyer is not so much, uh, um, I'm not calling upon in, in, in raising his name the outcomes of decisions, but how he has applied the facts in particular decisions. His decisions, his opinions have been fact-laden, uh, and that is highly important to give guidance to lower courts and guidance to our attorneys in applying the law. Thank you. And